start with the chapter seven, okay? Chapter seven. Give me a book. This will be more polite. E. Anatomy of the immune response. See, so far we are studying about the antigen, antibody, and the interactions, right? We are studying all, but um, the, um, like a immune response or immune system, uh, they have got their own organs, cells, and uh, the organization. So now, let us discuss about the operation of whole immune system. Okay. Let us study the operation of whole immune system. Immune system. Okay. So if you want to operate the whole immune system, you should name them. There are different type of cells and, uh, and different countries they are working, right? So we need to study about the nomenclature or naming the system. First name. How do you, how do you call, there are different cells, right? Name the different cells involved in this immune system. So how do you, um, how do you differentiate onto the cells? For example, uh, in a human being, okay, in humans, how do you distinguish a human, depending upon? Human, okay, see, I, in this system or in this immune response or, or this chapter, we are going to study the anatomy of the immune system. So the anatomy of the immune system, they have different cells, immune cells, correct? So among the different cells, the cells on a whole, but I want to differentiate, how do you distinguish one to the other? For example, I'm asking human beings, how do you differentiate a human being? Some criteria. What criteria you do that? Uh, th that's fine, you are going very molecular approach. Yes, that's fine. J j just I'm saying that either just the person is a male or female, correct? And then the human being is a, is a child or a teen or adult, right? And then if you got is married or non-married or bachelor, right? Or you are going to say whether this particular person belonging to either African or African American or Asian by race, and then you are also distinguish the person by color, and and then you go a little bit on on to the the morphology of that person's of eye color, and then go on molecular level. You are going on the DNA fingerprint or the DNA level everything. So you have just human being, but what you do, you are naming, yeah. Name, how, how do you name the person and personality? How do you, the same way, if you look into the immune system in the different cells of the immune system, we have to name them up. So that's what it's all about. I want to call it as a nomenclature. Do you ever heard of this nomenclature? Okay. That's in your chemistry, you have done, you have done the nomenclature and the identification of the compounds, right? You have a, which group is there and phenyl group or alkyl group and, you know, so that's the type of naming the situation. Nomen so here also there's a nomenclature for the cells. So if you understand that principle, then you can go, it's much more easier. Okay. 
the cells, they have their own the morphology like uh, we are going to name them using the surface marker. Surface markers of a cell, okay? So if I draw the another one, like a, a cell nucleus, and you have a marker one, then different type of marker. So these are, I am writing the a protein which is present in the membrane and, and, and they may have a different one or the same type of uh, marker. So it goes like this. So you have a, a marker one, two, three, four, like. So a, a type of cell will have number one, another type of cells may have two, another one may have four and three, or another one may have maybe 25 and 26. So you have a membrane marker, okay, or the surface markers. Now, the question is, what are those, or what are these, surface markers. So our goal is to name them, right? Name the individual cells. You just, you should not forget that our aim of this uh, class is anatomy of uh, the immune system. To start with, we are going to name the cells. Uh, how do you name the cells? Uh, one criteria which we are looking here in this one is the surface marker, uh, which I explained before. If you see these cells, and these cells will have a different uh, markers at the surface. This is a whole globular cells, and you know, inside a, a, a nucleus is there, but outside your cord and outside the membrane, and they have different markers. I'm just for your, say, for your understanding, I am writing in a different shape, uh, and that represents a different type of surface marker. They are proteins, right? And what do they do? What do they do? Question. These surface markers are they involved in communication, involved in communication, okay, where communication of both, okay, both outside of the cell, outside of the cell, and Inside of the cell. Inside of the cell. So what they'll do, they involved in communication. Communication, hey, what is uh, a strange molecule which is present outside this cell? So these surface markers will, will bind or will feel those molecules. As I mentioned before, these cells are blind cells, just like a Briley. They can touch and feel like that. These surface markers will encounter those molecules and then they communicate to them, number one. And once they have desired one, a molecule has been attached or the antigen or any other molecule which is there, it is outside and this communication will, will transmit the message inside the cytoplasm to the nucleus. And the nucleus is the king. And then he will make a decision whether, hey, in the, in the nucleus, we have a DNA. So the communication is going over there, and there are some ministers which is on floating in the cytoplasm, other molecules. And these molecules will screen them up, whether we can transmit this message to the king nucleus or the DNA, or sabotage them, or just degrade them, not to go into the positron. So, so the process of this surface marker is to communicate from outside world, uh, outside the cellular environment towards the inside the cell. So that's the communication number one, okay? Number, the next one, these surface markers are the surface markers are functional molecule, functional molecule. You know what is functional molecules? As I mentioned before, 
they use the function, I mean, they uh, determine whether this has been um, um, good message or bad message or it can be it can be passed on the message to the nucleus or not. So they are decision making and they are the functional molecule. And also these functional molecules on the communication, another one is the indicators of status. They are indicators. This, the surface markers are indicators of the status. What is status here? The cell has a status? Yes, they have a status. What is the status on this? The status is mainly of cellular differentiation. Cellular differentiation. What is cellular differentiation? What is the meaning on cellular differentiation? Anyone? From Cinco Ranch? Anyone from Victoria? No. Okay. Here in Sugarland, anyone? What is cellular differentiation? When you, yeah? Yes, but cellular differentiation is uh, is something like uh, um, I I go uh, a, a, a basic of the zygote, right? After the fertilization of the sperm and ova, you had a zygote, right? Unified. Uh, then after that, this zygote is going to differentiate, it's a divide, 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 and then in the different stages in the embryology, right? So here, at these stages, you have the different, that's on the meaning is stages of the cell maturity. I put it in the scientifically, okay? Stages of the cell maturity. What is stages of cell maturity? The cell what you are looking as, a, as an epithelial cell is not coming just like that as a magic epithelial cell. No, it is not like that. So it is being derived from a zygote one cell, fertilized cell, and then they're differentiated to many cells. Probably in the initial stage, you may get four and four cells become eight, and eight become uh, 16, and 16, 32, 32, 64. So they will form a clump of cells. Then eventually, these clumps of cells will differentiate some of them on 128 and some of them they will process for the muscle tissue, another one for the nervous tissue, and some of them are going for bone tissue, and some of them for the blood. I mean, all is coming from one cell. Do you understand? But during this, the cells are matured from a clump of cells on a different, different stages. It is not only a one-step process, no. There are different stages of these cells. The same way, if you are talking about the anatomy of immune system, we are talking about the different type of cells which involve the immune system. And those cells are originating from one cell to different type of cells. So these surface markers are the indicators so if you know what surface markers, the each surface markers will mature in one particular cellular differentiation of this stage. I put it in a, in a different way. Probably that is easy to understand. The cells, okay, suppose this is the one cell, but this cell will go on to the next cells. This is number two, this is number one. The same cell will, will be changed into cell two, and this is going to change into cell three, and this is cell is going to change cell four. Okay, so how shall I know this cell is become this, and this become this, and this become this? If I know the surface marker, here the cell one will, will establish a one type of surface marker of the protein, the cellular protein. And then, if this is being matured on the next stage, you may get not this one, but along with this, you may get the another one, which is here. And then for cell three, the type of three, you may get not this or this, but you have a, a different type of cellular marker. And finally, you know, you, this cell is matured to the final cell, and then you have this marker will become, uh, you know, this is a different type of marker. 
So this marker, if you track down in a, in a blood, if you isolate some cells, and then if you, if you tag this with a monoclonal antibody for this particular surface marker, then you will find out what all the cells which comes out this one, stage number one. Suppose the another monoclonal antibody which will, which will color, which will, which will uh, identify this. You can use this antibody to this, not this, so this or this, but only the cell two. Then we can say this is being surface marker two. The same way if the monoclonal antibody three will react with this, and then not this and not this, so we can have three. So, so na naming the uh, cells, these are different cells under differentiation or cellular differentiation, but we can exactly distinguish the cell one and cell four because there's a change in the surface marker. Do you understand that? So each cell will have is a characteristic of the surface markers, like, the, like a name of that one, okay? So if you have, how do you distinguish me, you, and a specific name on it? If, I, if you don't know the person's name, what you feel, hey, he's a male or he's a female, and then his height and weight and morphology, you are distinguished, correct? Are they, that's why I just I mentioned before how he looks like and what what type of dress he wears and how he so all those things is apart from the naming correct the the way the cells will hear this individual these cells will have will earn its own name of this because of the surface markers and we are going into the next level do you understand that these principles now how the surface markers are used to name the cells at different stages of the cells Okay. Now, so in the different type of cells, different types of cells. Okay. So what type of cells we have? It liver cell. They have their own kidney cells. Okay. Then the epithelial cell. Cells, and then fibroblast, adipose tissue, that's for the fat. We are studying all these in histology, you know about it. T cells, B cells, then lymphoid, okay, and macrophage, macrophage. So, there are, there are different type of cell. I mean, all have different surface markers. Okay? So, if you know what type of surface markers this or this or this, then you can easily identify that cell. Okay? Suppose if you have a pool of cell, if you have if you're beaker, I just I'll get I get a like a minced meat. Like have you heard of minced meat? What minced meat contain? Minced meat? They put liver, kidney, and all 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 parts of this animal are crushed together and then make a minced meat, right? It's not only the muscle, don't think that way. Even the nervous system also they put it even brine also they put it over there. That's why all burger about, all minced meat. All minced meat. So that, if you isolate, if you take, for example, the minced meat, okay, and then if you get the surface marker for the liver cell, kidney cells, and all these cells, and put the monoclonal antibody onto it, and then you will identify all cells in that minced meat. Because that's a mixture of all of them put together, right? So how do I, I know how many, how much of muscles there, how much of uh, nervous tissues there, how much. So how can I quantify that? If I have the monoclonal antibody of sheep, or beef, or chicken, or pork, yes, I can identify. And they also mix the meat. There's the sausages with the pork, beef, and chicken, and chicken franks. And so all of them, they're doing it, right? I mean, why I'm giving that suggestion is that is that you know everything is mixed together. If you identify only the pork part of that, I can use an monoclonal antibody. 
Suppose they said in a, in a food standardizing lab, and, and, and then if they want to identify, hey, there's a contamination is going on, yeah, there's a pork uh, meat which is cheaper when compared to uh, chicken meat which is expensive, they're mixing together. How do you identify that one? If they know, if they have that type of uh, antibody to a particular species, they can easily identify the contaminations and everything. That's the one part, just, just for an application part of that one. But you are understanding each type of cells, you know, you have a different type of surface markers. And surface markers are the name. So the immunologist, now I'm coming to the function of the immunologist, okay? Those who are studying the immunology, immune system. Immunologist. Immunology, L-O-G-I-S-T-S, -S, immunologist. And they developed what is called, I think we have extensively studied about the monoclonal antibody, right? Monoclonal antibodies. Monoclonal antibodies for these surface marker protein. So it is available, monoclonal antibodies or surface markers of this protein, okay? They are available, okay? And they are coming from all parts of the world. All parts of the scientists from all parts of the world and they have got their own monoclonal antibodies of different surface markers. So if there's a confusion, Australian scientists won't agree with the Americans, and American won't agree with the, uh, of the UK scientists. UK won't with the France, and France won't agree with the Germany. So it is a big uh, issue of um, of naming the cells. Say, I got an antibody. I got an antibody. I got. There, there must be some streamline of everything. Okay. So for that, they have a common name they gave. Common name for the identification of the surface marker, common name for identify, identifying the surface marker, I call, I call it SM. Okay. Result of this, a study of the old scientists, all of them, they call it as the cluster of monoclonals, cluster monoclonal antibodies, or monoclonals, I put it there, monoclonals is a plural, monoclonal antibodies, they are found to react with the same polypeptide. This is another concept which already you know, but I will revise you to again. Okay, same polypeptide are same surface marker. Cluster of monoclonals. A bunch of monoclonal antibodies which will identify, not one monoclonal, bunch of monoclonal identifying this one surface marker, same polypeptide. Okay. Now, what is this cluster? The cluster monoclonal. Cluster represents a series of reagents. Cluster represents a series of reagents. R -E G E N T S reagents that is reagents that is monoclonal antibodies. They are monoclonal antibodies reagents. Okay. They are defining defining a given surface marker. Surface marker. So there's a specific surface marker or one surface marker you have a a cluster 
a series of reagents. There are different types of monoclonal antibodies can bind with one surface molecule or the one um, uh, of the type of polypeptide. Okay, this surface marker then labeled with corresponding, okay, I'll put it, this surface marker, this surface marker, now label, labeling, okay, labeled with, labeled with uh, corresponding, corresponding cluster differentiation number. Okay, the surface marker labeled with corresponding, I, I, I'll go on to the next page, with corresponding, corresponding cluster differentiation number, cluster, C-L-U-S-T-E-R cluster, differentiation number. In other words, we call it as CD, not compact disc, okay? CD is cluster differentiation, CD. You may ask, how is it possible there are different monoclonal antibodies for one surface marker? Just one second, I'm explaining that. This is the cell, nucleus, okay? And I'm taking a, a surface marker here, okay? The surface marker, this one surface marker, okay? It looks like this, okay? Okay, this is from here to here. This is a surface marker, okay? From here to here. As I mentioned before, of uh, the epitope and paratope, if you could recollect, if this is the one of the receptors or the membrane surface molecule, and some of these monoclonal antibodies, which is over here, uh, to here, which can bind. So this is monoclonal antibody one. Some of the monoclonal antibodies will bind here, and this is uh, monoclonal antibody one, monoclonal antibody two can bind here, and then here, this is another one, which is a monoclonal antibody three. So, if you consider in one surface marker, there's a one polypeptide of this chain, what you get, three different type of monoclonal antibody can bind together. Do you understand that? So, this forms a cluster of reagent, okay? Cluster of reagent, otherwise called the CD, differentiation number. So we are naming this surface marker using this number, monoclonal antibodies number. We are not calling as a polypeptide one or polypeptide two, no. The polypeptide is being combined with another monoclonal antibodies so then we can name that peptide with that, just like a person, uh, I mean, as a culturally speaking, a lady married to a gentleman. Before that, what is the maiden name of that lady? She was carrying her father's maiden name, or family name, it's coming up. Once she got married, then what happened? The name is being changed to the husband's is that right? Is most of the culture, they, they change their name to the husband's second name and then they have the family name, they're going over there, correct? The same way, if this polypeptide up to this is fine, nobody knows what is happening. But when you combine with a, which monoclonal antibody is combined with that one, with that surface marker, then name that polypeptide with that surface marker monoclonal antibodies. Do you follow that principle? Right? For example, is anyone is married and before they change the name or anything, anybody? Huh? No? Not yet? 
I mean, j- just I'm asking. So I'm asking. So I I I I'll tell my 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 wife name is uh, before married is Chandra Thandavan. Okay. Then after married me, she removed the Thandavan and then she became Chandra Soma Sundaram on that part. So if you like the Soma Sundaram's family, if you call it, so it's going me, my wife, my son, every everyone together, right? It's a cluster of one cluster. But one class, same the cult, but different people there. Me, wife, son are different. But they are, suppose if you consider me as a monoclonal antibody, okay, my name is going through this polypeptide of the family. So this is a one person, this is another person, another person. So each, but all of them will carry the same name. But they have their own number. So a monoclonal antibody here, you can write CD. 50 or and then CDA, CD52 or CD53 or something like that. If you know if you have different number, you can give give the number. But if you call it as CD50, 52, 53, all clusters put together identify one particular surface marker. Do you understand that? The different molecules of monoclonal, but they mark, they identify one surface protein. So you should you should understand. So that's why we call that cell. This this cell is nothing to do with that initially. But once we identify with this, uh, the cell name is become taking the CD name. Suppose I'm isolating uh, CD50 cells, which is uh, marking, uh, which is binding with CD, CD50. So these cells itself we call it as CD50 cells. Another molecular molecule, CD85, surface marker, which is binding to another type of cell, then this cell is called as CD85, CD25, CD12. Like that, there are different names, or different numbers over there. OK, what numbers we have it now? If you go on to the surface marker, CD, currently, OK. Currently, we have 250 CD numbers. CD numbers. And they are assigned, found in your table. Could you see in your table, 8.1 in the old edition? You will find a uh, different one. Yeah, I'll, I'll show that here. If you, I'll focus a little bit. Could you see that one? CD1. And this expression is IDC and B subunit. Function presents in the glycolipase. And CD2, NK, receptor for this. CD3, some of the major cluster differentiation markers of hum- on human cell. CD14, CD16, CD21, CD28, T and B cell receptor. CD34, CD40. You get all different. CDs and the expression and their function. Now we are in a right track. Okay. They have the function and the cell surface molecules, and they have a. They are the name now. So now we name the child, right? All CDs here. Okay. Now this cell surface molecule cell. Surface. Okay, I'm just uh, uh, getting. Okay. Surface molecules often changes. So they change. These are as differentiator or cell differentiator. I explained it before. Uh, okay. Cell differentiator, you will get this. Uh, okay. R, the cell surface markers often changes its when it's cell differentiated from one cell to next to next cell, so each the cell surface marker changes. They also changes this one 
when it is become activated become activated okay when the cell normal cell this is a normal cell okay and then as soon as it is being activated by the x radiation or uv radiation or or any other chemical and this will change like this and this surface mo molecule will also change here normally one but it become three of them they change the shape activated or the cells are activated or i can also put aggravated aggravated keep quiet don't keep the cells you know keep quiet otherwise cells are getting angry if you are not why you are getting angry because your cells are getting angry why the cells are getting angry because they are you are feeding a good and bad to the to the neurons and, and the neuroendocrine systems and everything so the chemicals and everything change and immediately another reflex which is coming out and you become angry right so that's one of the expression but here the cells are getting aggravated and they also change its shape and also they can also uh, the novel communication novel communication so when the normal cells they have one type of surface molecule when it is activated by chemicals it changes its shapes or, or if it is aggravated it changes its surface molecules so meaning you have a response to it do you understand that because of chemical because of any uh, environment of the cellular uh, region so you get a changes in cell surface marker a different type of cd will be expressed here the cd28 you after the aggravation or activation you may get cd35 will be expressed over there or if the cells are differentiated from one to the other that may go on to another cell uh, and that cell is cd30 so this is cellular differentiation but when it the same cell which is activated you get cd35 and if it is being a aggravator you may get a cd uh, 40 same cell and their surface marker if you change so something like a same person is a good at his house okay eating going as a parent okay excuse me from victoria as somebody else pop in and then pop out okay anyway so once the person who is becoming on to this are the police officer right so he has to change his dress and everything and go to the work and with a, a gun and everything and knife everything put it together and then wearing his all safety clothes and everything so he is making a uniform and he is a police officer right and then once the police officer is going to catch a thief in a hide and seek and he has to change his is dress and outfit and then going as a civil person then going detective so so depending upon the need or the function he changes his morphology a change a changing the name identity or mask and everything is doing that all these function the same way the cells are normal cell naive nothing to worry about it keep quiet now once an aggravator or activator it changes its surface marker molecules now that surface mo molecule will identify him so how do you you want to identify the police officer when he is sitting and he is lunch in his house no when he comes out on his street on his police car and then he with the uniform he say hey he's a police officer because of his outfit because of his cell surface marker so that the same way a person a cell can establish in a different stages and a different state a uh, different name so at that time you call him as a police officer you won't call him as a daddy because he is is not at home he is at work and then he is a subordinate he is a, a deputy and then he he is going on a war front if he is going to fight the enemy and he is become a marine so so you get a different name and different output de depending upon its function the same way the cd are acting as a as a as the naming of the cell the same cell but it it goes just like an evolutionary thing but it is not an evolution but it is changing its its uh, its a position and function that's the thing do you follow or if you don't follow that now if, if i can also put in another way like um like a, a face is the index of mind what is that meaning it's 
the person, happy person, and he's the person, what happened? Changing. So you can easily identify that, right? Change body language. In the same way, a cell, which is having um, in a normal way, and if you have any antigen or any, any aggravator, the same cell, it looks like this. The cell become crazy. It's a normal cell. If you, if you think this one, it becomes a crazy cell. The cell morphology is totally changed. When you have aggravator or activator, the same cell will change. So we can say, we can also say this is a body language. What is the purpose of this body language? What is the purpose of this face expression? You are communicating by your body expression. Right? If you are so angry when you're driving in a freeway and somebody is cutting inside, then what do you get? You know, curse. <laughs> you know? So, uh, like that, it, it's coming automatically for anybody. Hey, because you are afraid of yourself, because if that guy is going in and if you hit him, and you will be in a trouble, right? So, you are worrying about yourself and, and then you express immediately on that one. And, and your body language also will speak with the other. You know, communication, that's a lot of communication. The same way the cells, they behave in a way whenever it, it encounters a molecule or any unwanted situation, it may change. But there's a purpose. After this, it may go on to the next level. Okay? Now, we'll go on to the next one. Why we need all these changes or the naming the cells? There's a need for organization. The need for organization, or you can also call it as for the lymphoid tissue. The lymphoid tissue, T I S S U E. Okay. So this is the tissue which is responsible for the organization. And the organization is coming from CDs, from different type of cells. Okay. And that give you effective what effective immune response effective immune response what is the effective immune response again yeah series of cellular event a series of cellular event okay what this series of cellular event which you get now. Now we will go back onto the story. Number one, antigen, which is the, coming from a bacteria or a viral or pollen or any other uh, foreign uh, molecules or the protein, which is getting into the system, the antigen first bind or processed by which cell? Antigen presenting cell presenting cell. They are binding with a type of cell. Antigen binds with a cell or it's been processed by a cell. That, press, that cell we call it as an antigen presenting cell. In other words, APC. This is the first encounter, right? And then what will happen? This APC now contact with T cells. They contact with the T cells and B cells. At the third level, then the T helper cell, T helper cell, assist B cells, assist B cells and cytotoxic T cells, cytotoxic T cells, cyt or T C cells, cytotoxic T cells. Number three, okay, and then three. Number four, amplify, amplify the potential of effector cell. Amplify the potential of the effector cell, EFF effector cells by the method of proliferation. So more cells will be produced at this stage. Cell 
And this lead to next stage, number five, that bring about differentiation, differentiation, differentiation to generate, to generate the mediators, mediators of humoral and cellular immunity, cellular immunity. And this process at the sixth. Now, if you follow through on this number one to the need for organization, you know, the, our, our main topic is to anatomy of the immune system response and how this effective immune response is bring out is by series of cellular events. What cellular events is being summarized here, like antigen or the virus or I put virus or bacteria or pollen or any other protein or any pathogen, with that may encounter into the cell, into the body and they bind are processed by antigen presenting cells. We will see that. So this is the normal one, but as soon as they bind, this the CD will change here. Cluster differentiation will change. And then the APC contact with the T cell, the APC with a particular CD will contact with the, with the T cell. Because why? T cell cannot accept the antigen presenting cells without this particular CD. And this CD or cluster differentiation is the language which can communicate to the T cells. So T cell can understand, T cell can touch and feel whenever there is a, a particular CD is present in the APC, antigen presenting cell. Then only the TC will, uh, uh, or the T cells will, will get activated. So now the, now the T cell got the message by communicating with, through this CD. So the T cell got the message or B cell got the message because of this changing in this particular cell, antigen presenting cell. Then what these cells will do after receiving this, they, they won't keep quiet and they will produce its own CD and changes its using the T helper cells also help to assist the B cells and cytotoxic T cells to produce more a different type of CD. And then the B cells where you get the amplify the potentials of the effector cell. The effector cells is the B cells. Where the B cells, after receiving the message, they become a plasma cell. Have you ever heard of the plasma cells where it will produce more of antibodies? So the plasma cells become, and they are more proliferation, more number of cells, and they bring out a different type of CD, a differentiation, cellular differentiation of those cells, of the macrophage or the uh, neutrophils and finally they also generate the mediators. What is the mediators which we have studied are adapter molecules, they are the antibodies. Also there's some cytotoxic cellular immunity and humoral immunity. The specific immunity and non-specific or innate immunity and those molecules are being produced. So, so these six points are serial of a cellular events. And that cellular events is possible if the CD is changing from one to the other. CD is the one. So there's a different type of CD here, a different type of CDs here, different type of CDs here, and you also get these CDs also getting cellular immunity, a different type of CDs over here. Do you follow this point up to this? Suppose a person is infected with HIV virus. What? situation is that a viral infection is going on okay the antigen presenting cells here they contact on the T cells the CDs and it normal process it should produce this path and produce more of humoral response or these antibody to it so if you measure the antibodies for the HIV virus in the blood if you if you have a method which we studied on the chapter six and seven, chapter seven, immunological methods. If we identify that antibody presence or the level of antibody, then you can say, hey, this person is infected with HIV. That's for, from Western blood. 
or from ELISA technique for the flu infection or viral infection. So that's a good sign of the application of immunology. But now, coming to this point, the CDs, if you have the cluster differentiation of monoclonal antibodies, then we can identify and isolate a particular species of these cells for our understanding and research and so on and so forth. Okay? So this part, you have to be very clear how these cells are being named or classified. Okay? All right. Now, I'll go on to the next slide. Any other additional response to it? Additional response for this um, activation of the cellular event is our producing memory cells. Memory cells. And these cells are activated by this response. Memory cell activator for yeah, secondary immune response. Secondary immune. And why to control the situation? We are going to study the mechanism, everything. Probably the next our our next class or the another couple of classes in the in the vaccination class. So this process is the memory cells. Whenever you vaccinated, you are activating and you are you, you, your immune system is being educated and trained well or primed T cells. So the next time when you get a contact with the viral and your secondary immune response, the memory cells are getting activated instead of taking for a long time to produce antibody. These memory cells immediately activate and you get more antibody in a short period of time and that can encounter and kill the pathogen. So that is the process uh, where we are educating our immune system through vaccine. Vaccines are, we are going to study the elaborate the mechanism, but I'm explaining a simple thing. Vaccines are, we are educating our immune system. That's all. Okay. What we can do for this? Using these CDs and... Uh, what we can do with the CDs, uh, different type of CDs and, and different type of cells, okay, using the CDs. We can do two way in vitro, that's in the test tube, okay? We can isolate specific cell, as I mentioned before, specific cells. Isolate specific cells and study, and we can study the antigen response. Antigen response in a yeah, test tube. Okay. How we can do that? Suppose if you take a test tube and you're putting a cells over here, and you know the type of cell, you know the CD55 of the particular cells are here, and if you add an antigen to it, and then what you get after that, after incubating for a while, and then isolate the cells, and then you can check for CD55, you won't get the response for the CD55 after incubation, you may get CD68 may be answering at the time. Do you follow that one? Just a pure in vitro study. I, I, I will write it in a, in a different way. Okay, this is a tube where you get the cells. So, and this is a, these cells will express initially what? CD55, that's what I said. Then, then what you do, you are adding the antigen a viral antigen to the tube, and then what you do after, after the addition of this viral particle, these cells will not answering for CD55, but it will work on the CD68. This is being answering to it. So 55 to 68, meaning that changes due to the antigen response to the cells. This is purely in vitro studies. So that's what the people, they will study 
identify what is the type of cells. I want to isolate CD55 cells and then add a bacteria or a toxin, and then that's been changes into CD65, not CD68. CD68 is responsible for virus, and CD65 will be response or the surface marker response for the, for the bacterial toxins. So you can study like that on your research or any other. Uh, yeah, there, are, there, there, there are different type of strains of virus. There are different type of infection. E. coli, there are different type of strain. Some of the E. coli benefit for us, some of them are bad for us. And so we want to dif distinguish at the time. How? Using this. So now you understand how the, um, the toxicology or food toxicology um, mechanism is working on that one to identify the toxin. A particular toxin is a, this toxin is different from the other one. This bacteria is different from the another one because this won't provoke the immune response. This will provoke the immune response. All those based on the CD surface marker. Yes? Good. We go on to the next one. The integration that the in vivo molecule, you know, in vivo studies. That's in vitro, this in vivo, where you can study the integration integrations of complex cellular interaction complex cellular interaction <coughs> complex cellular interactions that is from the basis of the immune response this is if you inject into the animal what will happen in vivo, a toxin. That's what I'm referring to. Okay. And this immune response takes place within the organized, organized architecture. Organized architecture, meaning you need to know what organs responsible for differentiating these different cellular events. So I mentioned a couple of slides before I explained that there are different uh, uh, series, cellular events of six points I explained to you, right? Where these cellular events are occurring, which part which is occurring, what cells are responsible, that's what the architecture is all about. Okay? Okay, now, the architecture, I put BR, right? Parts of the tissue. Parts of the tissue. Okay. What parts of the tissue here is peripheral, peripheral lymphoid tissue, peripheral lymphoid tissue. Another one is the B, that's a secondary lymphoid tissue, primary or secondary. Secondary lymphoid tissue, the same thing. And they also include primary and secondary, they include lymph node, lymph nodes of our body, and they also include spleen, organ, and also you have an unencapsulated tissue lining. And encapsulated tissue and this tissue is having a lining and that molecule here we will study that malt we'll see that one what is that respiratory tract where this tissue lining is there respiratory tract to gastro intestinal tract and then uh, genitourinary, genitourinary tract. So, if you have an infection or any other pathogen getting into your system, that will either process into the lymph node, they may either go to the spleen from here to here, or go directly to the spleen and then process there, or they'll be handled by the uh, tissue lining of uh, respiratory tissue lining or gastrointestinal tissue lining or genitourinary tissue lining. If you note, these are the part where you have external direct contact, directly contact with the air getting in, or you, uh, food and water, you are swallow gastrointestinal, 
okay and genital urinary that is also can be exposed outside also in the, you know in case that's also going inside by 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 the female you know if you got the uh, you know by copulation if they have to go or the sperm is getting in, inside the system genital urinary system so those things also you know consider this onion capsule tissue lining will protect against any other injury so that's why this is a tissue for the protection and lymph node is a tissue for the protection spleen is also tissue for the for the organ that's also uh, tissue for the protection for this now these tissues are now populated with the cellular origin okay now i will give you a break and we will come back maybe another 5 to 10 minutes and then we will study how these organs this anatomy of immune response play a major role in protecting us okay any question any question synchro ranch or victoria okay you are the only person what happened to the people there is there any exam or you don't know anything huh Probably there, there, there are a bunch of students there who have been absent. Probably they, they find the, the lecture series on the video lectures. Probably they don't want to come to the class and waste our time, right? That's not the thing. It's uh, only the, um, you know, supplemental video lectures. But uh, most of the work uh, will be done uh, discussed in the class. I want to have active participation in this class. Anyway, I will, I'll inform them for the next time. Okay. Any questions here in Sugarland? No? Okay, just we wait and then we will go through that. Do you follow all bet now? Yes, I do, Dr. Sumo. Okay, good.
Oh, I'm sorry. I'm um, changing. I turn on the Thank mic you. here. Okay, sorry. So now, you go on to the text um, book if you have this uh, uh, 8 1 in your book. The old version, I have it. But if you're a new version, you can check in this picture. Probably it might be the same one or the different one. Is it a different one? Do you have this one? You don't have it? Yeah. Chef son, okay. You have the same. So the primary lymphoid organ, secondary lymphoid organ, okay? And the immune response, and, and then here you got the education. So in the primary lymphoid organ, thymus and bone marrow, you are educating the T cells. Because that is the first encounter of this uh, uh, antigen. And then bone marrow also is in you know these these cells, these stem cells. That that's why thymus as well as for these B cells. And then it comes out in the encapsulated form, like a lymph node or the spleen. Encapsulated means that cells is is being um, um, is being captured onto the uh, onto this organ, secondary lymphoid organ. Okay, and then unencapsulated one that's on malt. The malt is, we'll, I'll, I'll explain a little bit, mucosal associated lymphoid tissue. Mucosal associated. So all the mucosal tissues, that is going to be taken care of an encapsulated one. This encapsulated of this antigen is taken care of the lymph node as well as the spleen. And then immune response in this organ is antigen to the tissue, to antigens in tissues, to antigens in blood. Spleen will handle the blood and the lymph node will handle the antigen from the tissues. And these are the antigens are all mucosal surface area wherever in our body that is being uh, carried out by the mall. So, so these are the place, these are the organ, and that is uh, uh, are the primary as well as the secondary will take care or handling of this uh, pathogen or antigen which is uncovering into the body. I just I'll go on to the, on to the next one. Um, perhaps I can go on to my PowerPoint. That we'll get in a minute. Okay, these are the one which is a. Uh, this is the one which I want to show you. We see the thymus and bone marrow cells and lymph node spleen malt. Also, lymphoid tissue organization, germinal centers with their meshwork of follicular and dendritic cells, expand B cells. So that is the secondary antigen challenge. And this is the one which I, I explained to you in, the, in, in a differentiation into the memory cells or the, or the plasma cells. Okay, now coming back. Figure 8.1, we have just now finished, and then we can also go on to the major distribution of those cells. Major distribution. Major distribution of these cells in, this, in, the, in our body, okay, or in the lymphoid organ. Lymphoid organ, where it is being distributed. Just a second. Here, in this in this picture, could you see that uh, there are different one lymph nodes, tonsils, adenoids, and these thymus over here, and bone marrow, mesenteric lymph nodes. You can see this one, mesenteric lymph nodes over here. These are the one, and Peyer's patches. We have studied in lamina propria and mesenteric lymph nodes and uh, in our histo histo histology lab. And then this is the urogenital. Uh, here we've got the lymph node as well, and here the urogenital of, uh, of a malt, okay? So here the yellow color mucosal associated lymphoid tissue, uh, malt, here, 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 all malt, okay? Then the lymph nodes and spleen, which is our light one here, lymph nodes and spleen. And the primary lymphoid organs on this one, this is a primary lymphoid organ. So you have the different color and that coded one. That's in your figure. 
in your textbook if you find it. And here you get the um, the lymph nodes, how they with the network, lymphatic vessels, thoracic duct, and uh, left subclavian vein here, thoracic duct over here. So you find the lymph nodes, they act just like a pumping station, like a heart. And the, the research, not much being done or carried out in lymph nodes or lymphatic vessels. I have my, uh, I have one friend, and, and, and then he is working in Texas A&M College Station, and then he was working initially on cardiovascular system. Now he has switched to lymphatics because lymph, the lymphatics and lymph node, there is no, not much work being done. So he is, he is uh, working a uh, very good uh, research on, uh, on characterizing the protein which is involved in contractile function of these uh, lymphatics. So I, um, I just visited and then uh, in his lab and then I saw he, just like a heart cells, and these are the contracting, relaxing, re relaxation which is going on in this particular lymphatic cells, okay? And then these are the uh, mucosal associated, that's the lymphoid, uh, I mean the mechanism of the subepithelial cells with the lining, uh, the malt is mainly of secretory immune system which bathes the surface with protective IgA antibodies. So the one which we just saw uh, on a malt, and they secrete this antibody, IgA antibodies, and these IgA antibodies will, uh, will bind with any pathogen and, they, and thereby they can protect us. So if you don't have IgA secretion in your mucus of your genitourinary, or you have a oral or your nasal, or in a gastrointestinal for the matter of fact, you are likely to get the infection. So you have to have IgA, more IgA. Okay, so that is very important on the system. Okay. Now we'll go on to the document camera again. So these are the organ. And then we also should know about the homing and the transmigration of the lymphocytes. How the lymphocytes, how lymphocytes migrate. Okay. So this is a blood vessel. Okay. And here the, you have a macrophage or the polymorph nucleus cells. And here there is an uh, uh, infectious agent here, infection going on. So from here, the, it can contact with the tissue macrophage and everything, but it should come from here. So how these cells become rolling down, rolling down, and then squeezes in between the reticular endothelial space, and then is getting in, and then comes in contact with this. So that is a, a small animation, which I can show you now. can go on to this one animations. The bone marrow and thymus constitute the primary lymphoid organs. These are the places in which lymphocytes are produced. Multipotential stem cells within the bone marrow form all of the leukocytes, erythrocytes, and platelets. Lymphocytes derived from these stem cells are required to undergo a process sometimes referred to as education. Thus, those lymphocytes destined to become T cells must first go to the thymus, where they undergo both positive and negative selection processes. These selection processes ensure that the T cell receptors borne by mature T lymphocytes are able to recognize peptides derived from foreign antigen presented by self MHC molecules. T cells unable to recognize self MHC molecules and those that are able to recognize self-peptides presented by self-MHC molecules are eliminated by apoptosis, a form of programmed cell death. In avian species, the cells destined to become B lymphocytes must first pass to an organ called the bursa of Fabricius, where they're able to mature into immunocompetent B lymphocytes. In mammalian species, this differentiation into immunocompetent B cells occurs within the bone marrow itself. Once functionally mature, T cells and B cells are able to leave the thymus and bone marrow, respectively, and traffic to the secondary lymphoid organs. The encapsulated secondary lymphoid organs comprise the lymph nodes and the spleen, 
whilst the unencapsulated secondary lymphoid tissues comprised the mucosal-associated lymphoid tissues, or MORT. These different secondary lymphoid organs are specialized to deal with infectious agents in different anatomical locations. Lymph nodes deal mainly with infectious agents in the tissues. The spleen deals mainly with infectious agents in the blood. And the malt deals with infectious agents at mucosal surfaces. The primary lymphoid organs comprise the bone marrow and thymus. Bone marrow is present in the large bone throughout the body and is the site of production of the multipotential stem cell. B lymphocytes in mammalian species develop within the bone marrow, whilst T lymphocytes reach maturity within the thymus. The thymus is a gland in the neck and serves as a major site for positive and negative selection of T lymphocytes. The vast majority of T cells within the thymus actually die. This rather alarming fact relates to the necessity that T cells recognize foreign peptides presented by self-MHC molecules. As the rearrangement of T cell receptor genes is essentially a random process, the vast majority of T cells will express receptors that are either useless because they're unable to recognize self-MHC, or they may recognize self-peptides. T cells able to recognize self-peptides could partake in potentially harmful autoimmune responses. The need to eliminate such cells, be they useless or potentially harmful, explains the massive T cell death seen within the thymus. As there is essentially no difference between a self-peptide and a peptide derived from foreign antigen, in that all peptides consist of a sequence derived from the 20 amino acids, the T cells are unable to differentiate self from foreign peptides. However, foreign peptides, for example from infectious agents, will not usually gain access to the thymus, whereas self-antigens will always be present and should clonally delete, that is, negatively select, those autoreactive T cells to which they can bind. The lymph nodes and spleen are shown in light grey. Lymph nodes are distributed throughout the body and sample lymph draining from the tissue. Only a few of the many lymph nodes throughout the body are shown in the illustration. The mesenteric lymph nodes in the gut are also illustrated. Lymph nodes tend to deal with infections in the tissues, whilst the spleen is specialized to deal with infections in the circulation. The mucosal associated lymphoid tissue, MORT, is found in mucosal tissues throughout the body. Thus, the Waltaire's ring consists of the lymph nodes, tonsils and adenoids, which are well placed to deal with infections in the nasal and buccal cavities. Mucosal associated lymphoid tissues in the lungs are able to deal with inhaled antigens, whilst those in the lamina propria and payer's patches deal with ingested antigens. Finally, the urogenital tract is also protected by mucosal associated lymphoid tissue. The lymphatic vessels carry antigens from the tissues to the local lymph nodes, where all of the cells required to mount an immune response are present. Lymphocytes continuously recirculate between the tissues, the bloodstream and the lymph nodes, enabling antigen-reactive cells to be recruited to sites at which an immune response is occurring. The lymph from these lymph nodes finally collects in the thoracic duct and then returns to the bloodstream via the left subclavian vein. Lymphocytes are able to pass from the blood into the tissues via high endothelial venules, HEV. Lymphatic vessels draining the tissues will carry these lymphocytes, as well as antigen, via the afferent lymphatics to the draining lymph nodes. Because T cells, B cells and antigen presenting cells are all present in the lymph node, it acts as a control center from which the response against antigens in the tissues can be mounted. Lymphocytes are able to exit the lymph node via the efferent lymphatics and return to the circulation via the thoracic duct. Thus, lymphocytes which have proliferated in response to a threat from an infectious microorganism 
are then able to be distributed throughout the body. Lymphocytes from the blood are also able to pass through the lymphoid tissues of the spleen, where, again, all the cells necessary to mount an efficient immune response are present. Scanning EM pictures are always nice to look at, and this one also illustrates an important point. It shows three lymphocytes adhering to the high-walled endothelial cells of the postcapillary venules in a lymph node. Binding to the endothelial wall will be followed by passage of the lymphocytes out of the circulation and into the lymph node, where, if they bear antigen receptors of appropriate specificity, they will be able to partake in an immune response against antigens derived from infectious agents in the tissues local to the lymph node. Lymphocytes are able to pass from the blood into the tissues The lymphatic vessels carry we are, we, we are done that, that part of our uh, thing and this side, yes, this we are done, lymphocyte traffic. This is the one which is uh, how these uh, lymphocytes is being moved by from one place to the other, right, from the, the one which uh, from blood vessels to the tissue. Flattening of the lymphocytes and transmigration across the endothelial cell follow the LFA1 activation. This is another the membrane receptors and activation. And then entry of the memory T cells uh, into sites of inflammation facilitated by the DLA, LFA, and the lymphocytes corresponding to VCAM and ICAM. So these are the, these are the binding molecules, okay, intracellular activating binding molecules, and they will do the proper function to move the lymphocytes into the proper uh, area where the infection is going on. If you see this uh, step one, step two, step three, step four, step five, like a tethering, this is the one microvillus and, and the lymphocyte, this is being activated. As I mentioned before, at the beginning of the class, this is a normal one, but as soon as it gets being bound or being activated, it started coming to this wall, it's been attached to this endothelial cells, and then it's move, 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 and you can see that one here, the red dot. And that is, again, a changing in the surface markers. And that is necessary to bind and attach to the cells. And then it will squeeze around because of the chemotactic gradient is more, and then here it is less. And, and, and then this chemotactic are it attract these cells to here. So it squeezes in between these two cells of endothelial cell vessel and then reaches their uh, destination. So that's how from blood vessel to that area, this is the interesting concept, how the chemotaxis is working. These are the different steps involved. So the handling of antigen, macrophages and antigen presenting cells, they can activate on hematopoietic origin or the process of antigen. And the antigen is, again, the process in the macrophage, as well as they are antigen uh, carrying cells or the dendritic cells or T cells or the primary T cells response. This is the handling of antigen. I'll just, I'll give you the next one into my document camera. Perhaps that will be easy to understand. Um, the enjoyment of privilege, that's the one you should understand. Enjoyment of privilege. Privilege sites. There are certain regions, okay, there are certain regions or certain tissues, it is very difficult to infect or carry out any dangerous um, exposition by the antigen or the infection is going on, okay? That's in the antigen present in certain tissue, antigen, though the antigen are present, okay? Present in certain tissue, do not provoke, do not provoke an immune response. So far, we have studied in our earlier sites that tissues which is responding to infection. The tissues will be activated by infection. The cells that is activated by the any infection. So that part which we have covered. Now we are going on to the new dimension. There are certain regions in our body 
where there is the infection agent or antigen which cannot provoke any immune response. Okay? It fails. It, it is unable to provoke any immune response in that site. So that's what we, those sites, we call it as enjoyment of privileged sites. Okay, they do not provoke an immune response against themselves. But example here, brine tissue, anterior chamber of eye, anterior chamber of eye. How many of you want to become an ophthalmologist? Huh? You want to be an ophthalmologist? Anterior chamber of, uh, of the eye. Sorry. And then testis. Okay. Why they are protected by? They are protected. These tissues, okay. They are protected by a strong, a strong blood tissue barrier. Barrier. BTR. In, in the brain, we call it as a blood brain barrier, BBB, triple B, not business, best bureau of business. Okay. It's the best bureau of brain, you can say, right? You know? So you cannot, the, the blood brain barrier is so thick, it cannot penetrate, the antigen cannot go in. But in spite of that, that one one peptide is migrating it, prions. Once it's getting into the brain, prions start multiplying, 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 just like a virus. It's not a virus, it's a prion protein, mad cow disease and everything. So that's why it's a naturally we have some protection. Then why there isn't a testis? Okay, it's a brain, that's fine. Why is a testis? Because in, in a biology on the natural evolution, you need to protect the one which is going to propagate its own species. So that is also been sabotaged or infected or and injected by any other damage. So that is also been very preserved by any antigen infection. But except the irradiation. Ir if there is an X irradiation or any other radiation getting a testis and that is that is damaging that particular organ. Okay. So that's one Hiroshima, Nagasaki, those children and after children and after children, they suffer from Ma, I mean, there's some deformities in their health because of this radiation still going on there. But any chemical or any other, it will protect. And, and I also been good, very good protection. The anterior chamber of eye, you cannot, though the eye was, uh, uh, by is just open, it, it can assimilate everything, but at the same time, it also gives a protection. That's a good sign of the eye. Okay, good. Um, they also have low permeability. See, that's why it's very difficult to design a drug for any other brain tumor or any other brain-related one. If anything is going on inside the brain, it's very difficult to, to manage that because of the low permeability. The drug cannot pass through. If they have the drug, the uh, blood-brain barrier is being breached. There are two things may occur. They either that is more uh, liable to have any infection, but if the drug is good, yes, it can treat migraine and certain type of disease. That's why the most of the pain killers, they are in the periphery site. If you control onto the brain of any other mechanism, that's what they got on meditation and, and also some other the yogic type tactic principles. So they used to control the brain and then you can control your body and organs. That's a different type of uh, you know, mechanism and physiology. So it's very, very good information, like low permeability for any antigen. And also they have a um, permeability to, low permeability to hydrophilic compounds. Hydrophilic compounds. And also a very low permeability to carrier mediator transport. Carrier mediator transport. that part, and when you organize the handling of antigen, where does the antigen go when it enters the body? Where the antigen?
antigen. Where is the antigen? Where the antigen will go? After enter enter into the body. After penetration, the tissues, they go onto the lymph, okay? And lymph nodes, where it's getting drained off, okay? Drained and then filtered. So we have to see the structure of the lymph and lymph nodes, I mean it. And the antigen encounter into the upper respiratory, it encounters malt, which just now we have seen this slide. And if it enters into the blood, and that will go onto the spleen. And macrophage in the liver, and that is also, you know, will take care onto the, onto the blood bond thing, okay? So when you go through of your slides and, and um, on your PowerPoint, and we have, um, we have given summarize of this, what we have done. And this is the one where the lymphatic nodes, the structure of, uh, and different, where the B cells, lymphocyte, germinal layer, where they are processing is going on. And here the plasma cells, how the anti antibody and secondary blast, and, and then and, and the, how these cells is being organized in a way it can produce more of antibody and memory cells here. And here the another cartoon of how this spleen is handling. And these are the cycle which already been explained, the handling. And here the surface through the uh, immunoglobulin with the C3B receptors and complements, and they also play a major role in encountering the antigen, the malt, and you can see this how the antigen uh, presenting cells with the bone marrow cells to bone and, and then how the cells is being a learning process, okay, non-lymphoid and lymphoid tissue. So any question so far in this? Any questions? More questions? So now the next chapter which we need to go on to the uh, lymph site activation. Chapter 8, is that right? In your textbook? Chapter 8 in the new edition. Lymphocyte activation. Why we need to study this? So far we have studied about the different type of cells and where the cells are being produced. Now uh, 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 the antigen antibody interactions and, and then membrane receptor interactions, we have studied so, so far, no problem. But now these cells uh, are the T cells and B cells, T lymphocyte, B lymphocyte, how they are activated. And that's very interesting part and um, we'll see the two types of lymphocytes. Two types of lymphocytes. What are the two types? T lymphocytes. We call it as a T cells, and B lymphocytes. We call it as a B cells. Okay. Now we should know the difference between the T cells and B cells. Okay. Difference. What are the difference? Differences between the T cells and B cells. Okay. So we'll have a. Um, um, a table like thing where the differences, a type of differences, type of difference, and uh, you have uh, got the T cells and here the B cells. You can put it under T and B. Okay. Number one, percent in peripheral blood. How much percentage in peripheral blood? If you isolate from the blood, peripheral blood, how much? 65 to 80 percent of the cells on the lymphocyte cells are the T cells and then 8 to 15 percent of them are the B cells. Now antigen recognition, which cells will be antigen recognition function, antigen recognition. Now here it will recognize, T cell can recognize a processed antigen, processed antigen recognition, okay. Here it can recognize the native, meaning in this processed um, one where the antigen is being, suppose if this is the viral protein and, and this protein is being getting into 
macrophage and the macrophage will 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 process this uh, antigen or the protein and then it will give a polypeptide onto the cell surface and then this T cell can recognize this processed one whereas in the B cell when the B cell will come and it can recognize the the same antigen the native antigen antigenic protein directly interact with the native one so that is the difference on the processed antigen and is non processed or the native antigen it can recognize okay number 3 cell surface molecules which is just now we are finished okay cell surface molecule so like a receptors okay cell surface molecule there are different types over there okay antigen receptors ag receptor here you get the tcr t cell receptors or cd3 now i am going on cd cd means cluster differentiation cd3 molecules uh, which is present over the cell surface and surface ag surface immunoglobulin surface immunoglobulin surface ig if you remember correct when the b cells a part of the b cell when they before uh, two types of cells and some of the cells will go on the plasma cells and the genes being activated and uh, that is going on antibody which is secretion but some of them are the immunoglobulin molecule which is attached to the surface molecule so these are the surface molecules are the b cells some of the b cells which will secrete this an immunoglobulin to the to the to the blood and those cells are plasma cells and this immunoglobulin called as antibody in other words the surface ig are the truncated or mutilated or broken antibody and that piece is sticking onto the surface of the cell as a marker so that's why you should remember that okay p mhc1 major histocompatibility complex 1 which is present in both in both positive positive okay and then c mhc2 molecules and here only after stimulation they are present only after stimulation as i mentioned before some cells are changing you know after aggravating the changing the shape right so they stimulate mhc2 presence after the stimulation otherwise there is no mhc2 molecule only stimulation you get it but here it is normally present in the surface uh, molecule mhc2 then d and the cluster differentiation CD2, they are present and here it is absent. It is absent in B cell. But CD2, if you, if you get a, 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 a tube full of, uh, if you isolate lymphocyte population, which will have both B cell and T cell, okay. And if you want to isolate, identify only the T cell, what you need to do, you add the antibody of CD2. And this will antibody will bind only to T cell and not to B cell. And then you can classify, you can, you can separate it out. So that is the uh, kind of um, function of this one. And E C D4, another C D is a C D4, which is present with the MHC2 plus as a, as a helper cell. Helper cell on the T, T cell population, you have a helper cell, you get it, T helper cell C D4. And here it is, it is absent. It is absent in B cell. F C D5. C D5 is present and here it is present only in as a subset. Subset of a B1 subset. It is not all B cells you won't find. Only one particular type of cells only you get a C D5. F G and then C D8 cell. You can get MHC one plus this cell restrictor plus cytotoxic T cell only. So cytotoxic T cells. If you want to isolate cytotoxic T cells, then you have to add the CD8 antibody and to pick up one, something like a bait, you know, whole lake of lymphocytes are floating around. You want to hook it up only the cytotoxic T cell you want to isolate. Then you hook it up with the CD8 as a as a worm, right, and a bait, and then it will go and bind together, and then you can separate it out. 
And, and, and then MHC1 and cytotoxic T cells, which you can bind CD8. Now, the next one here in the B cell, they are absent. CD8 is absent, okay? Now, again, I'm just going on to the next one. Yep. CD5 is present in T cell and in uh, B cell only a subset, only a subset of B cell. Then the H, you get like a CD19, CD20, CD21, 23, and 32. Sorry, 32. CD, CD, CD. All CDs. They are absent. They are absent in T cells. They are absent in T cells. No. No CDs. And here they are present in the B cell. Okay. So now, these are B cells. Okay. B cells, they are present. All the CD 20, 19, 21, 23, and 32. But in T cells, they are absent. So now you can you know, use the CD as a, as a mean to separate and study the mechanism of different type of, of the lymphocytes. Do you follow now? Yes? Now, the another one is the polyclonal activation. Another property, polyclonal activation. Here, the anti-CD3 you know, when you do a polyclonal activation, that meaning, you know, when you inject with a, a type of uh, a weed or type of uh, uh, antigen or the bacterial infection, I mean, how these cells will respond? Here, the, they said anti-CD3, folk weed, folk weed antigen, uh, mitogen, folk weed mitogen, and phytohemoglutinin. So, this will activate, but here the B cell can be activated by anti-Ig, immunoglobulin, and uh, folk weed. So both, here it will activate only this anti-CD3 and the folk weed mitogen can activate this one, polyclonal activation, and then anti-Ig, immunoglobulin, anti-Ig, and folk weed can activate here in the B cells that can be activated. And then also another one, the Epstein-Barr virus. Epstein-Barr virus. That can activate the B cell in the polyclonal activation. So this is a, this is a part of a classification of these lymphocytes. And the lymphocytes activation, you can, uh, first of all, we should know what all the CDs, which is specific for T cell, what are the CDs specific for the B cell? So if you know B cells and T cells, and you know the CDs, list of CDs, then you can name the cells, like I mentioned from the beginning of the class as the nomenclature of the immune response system. Okay. Now we are going on to the lab practice. What are we going to do with these cells, with these, uh, with these CDs and, and the, how we are going to activate? Okay. In lab practice, we use the anti, anti CD3 for T cells. Okay. And in lab practice, we use anti immunoglobulin 3 for B cell activation. Don't forget it. The topic of this lecture is lymphocyte activation. Okay. Lymphocytes are there, right? how they are activated. If you do anti-CD3, that will activate the T cell, and anti-IG, that can uh, immunoglobulin, and that will activate the B cells, okay? And this can be studied in a, in a peripheral blood if you do that, okay? Now, another part we can also do, this is one part, another one, another type, CD2, plus another complement. You know, you have studied complement the innate immunity, right? And they will precipitate the T cells in a population. Suppose you are isolating a peripheral blood. Peripheral blood. A person is donating the blood, okay? Onto that blood, you add CD2 and complements, and that will precipitate the T cells. 
and what happened? The B cells are in in the liquid are supernatant. B cells are found in supernatant. So if you have a blood, I want to see only the T cell. What shall I do? I have to add anti, sorry, complement and CD2. These two components I have to add to the peripheral blood and centrifuge it. What will happen? The CD2 will go and bind, and once it's bind, and it will precipitate to pull down all the T cells, pull down, and then rest of them are, are going to be floating around on the supernatant. So if you have a blood, and then if you have a whole blood, and, and then if you add the, the cells are there, and then if you add CD2, the next after spinning, what will happen? You get this, all these cells will pull down and settle here. And some of them are floating around, and that's the B cell. And precipitate cells, all of them, they call it the T cell. Okay, that's another use of this one. So next, we have to isolate the T cells. Now we have isolated from the precipitate, right? And next, next we have to isolate or identify, identify subset, subsets of T cells. What is the subsets of T cells? We have to identify T helper cells and cytotoxic T cell, another one. Another type of subset, cytotoxic T cells. What is the function of cytotoxic T cells? Whenever there is a, 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 a bacterial, uh, sorry, viral infections going on into the cells, and the cytotoxic T cells will go and send the signal for the apoptosis. So the cells, infected cell, will die. That's why they said a cytotoxic T cell. If you have more, even the cancer cells can be destroyed by cytotoxic T cells. So if there's a cancer patient is there, then if you give you more number of cytotoxic T cell to the cancer patient, yes, that cancer has become reduced. The cancer will fight and the cancer will, uh, will, will, will go away. Our cytotoxic T cells will take out most of them. So you need more of these cells. But if you combined with uh, uh, a chemotherapy and cytotoxic T cells, it won't work. Because why? The chemotherapy will kill the cytotoxic T cells. So you won't get the cells will won't die. So you should be, you know, very careful. In 1980, 85, they said, hey, they found a, a cure for cancer because you can just, uh, you know, just like a replacement of blood, you can replacement with the blood along with the, along with the T cells, cytotoxic T cells, and, and then that will take care. Don't worry about it. That's okay, principally okay, but not, not being successful. But that's one of the procedures, cytotoxic T cells. And also, you can also refer into your table and um, these, uh, C how do isolate here, CD4? CD4 is the marker, marker of T helper cell. We have just now, we have studied, okay? Uh, we also call it TH, T small h. That is the T helper cells, okay? And what is the function of these T helper cells? T helper cells, will activate, okay, activate and mature. It, it induces the activation and it induces the maturation for B cells and cytotoxic T cells, cytotoxic T cells. So the CD4, if you add to the pool of the T cell, you can isolate the T helper cells. T helper cell present only you know, it will activate. What is the T helper? It helps to mature or activate the B cell. Also, it helps for the mature of the cytotoxic T cells. That's why it is called the T helper cells. So, how many cells we are studying now in the T sub cell, T cells population, T helper cells, and cytotoxic T cells? What is the goal of our class today? Activation, lymphocyte activation. And here, the lymphocyte activation, we have studied about the T helper cells and that is being activated B cell and T helper cell activated the cytotoxic T cells. And also how to isolate the T helper cells? If you use a CD4 antibody and that will identify the marker, that's the marker for the T helper cells. So that's the part of it, okay? So what I'll do, I'll, um, I'll stop here.
and then I will go through the um, the lecture part um, next week to to start working on um, on uh, continuing this lecture. That's one, the chapter eight of the lymphocyte activation. I spent a few minutes on to your discussion today. What do you follow? I want some questions or on from this today's topic because today we covered one chapter and also a little bit of the next chapter as well. Okay. You will get some questions from this presentations. Okay, the, so that's why in your exam you will get it. Okay. What type of questions you will get it in this? So I will give you some other questions. So please prepare from this lecture part and that will help you. Okay. Question one. This is purely the answers coming from the lecture part. Okay. What are the surface markers? What are surface what are surface markers of a cell this question okay you study this th these questions will come for your exam or if you write the answer from you from this to write your uh, summary of your homework that's also good but you study these questions okay and then uh, write short Notes on functional molecules. Functional molecule, which we have studied earlier. Okay. And three short notes. Okay. This is the A uh, as well as B. Write short notes. I am the sub question on uh, C D. What is CD? Cluster differentiation. Okay, you write short notes on that, and not one word. You have to write at least to write short notes, on uh, you know at least of four to five sentences, five lines. You have to write that way, and then um, tissues. Write short notes on tissues of immune response. We have studied the primary or the uh, lymphoid tissue, secondary lymphoid tissue, peripheral lymphoid tissue, right? Lymph node spleen and everything. Tissues of immune response, right? Short notes. D, okay. Handling of antigen. How these tissues are handling different tissues are handling this uh, uh, different way you know uh, mucosal surface malt as a spleen and um, also we also did studied about uh, the lymphatic organs right lymph nodes so different um, tissues they handle a different ways of handling their antigen and then um, e on the enjoyment of privileged sites what is that one enjoyment of privileged sites. This is the brain, anterior chamber of eye and testis, and those we need to write it. Okay. And then F, this is another next uh, chapter where you have to study about the differences, differences of T cells and the B cells. So these are the questions for these lectures today. Okay. So if you if you read and, and try to answer all of them into your into your homework, or uh, if prepare for this and some other questions coming definitely in your exam, and there is no bonus points for this. Okay. You may get some bonus points by studying the supplement book. But not for this. This is for your direct grade. Okay. Write short notes. Always you try to try to do four to five lines. Don't try. If you write five five, five lines, means I'm giving five points for each one for the grade. If you write one line, 
you will get only one point. You may think, I narrated, summarized. No, don't summarize. You elaborate, you extrapolate, you add to it in your own words. Okay? Book may say, well, the book, they don't have it. You think you write on your own. What do you think? Related to it. Okay? To the subject or out of the subject, you can correlate and, and discuss and you can also put it to your own way. That's the way it's a part of the learning process. Not simply what you have in the book and then you are writing it. That's not the thing. I'm going very basically. And if you don't understand, please ask question. I can be able to answer that question to you. Okay? Yes. What was it? Oh, the E1. Enjoyment of privileged sites, which we have um, we have just uh, studied uh, a little bit ago. And uh, one here, enjoyment of privileged site, antigen present in certain tissue do not provoke an immune response. So this is a definition. And then you have to write an a, a, a example, Brian anterior chamber testes and they are protected by strong blood tissue barrier. So this is how many lines? One, two, three, four, five. This is the one I, I expect the answer from you, basically. Okay? Then I want to know this lecture, what are the, uh, um, the, you know, the surface marker of the cell or the, you know, tissues of immune response and, and the tissues of uh, non-responsiveness. So both you should know about it. What tissues involved in immune response, what tissues is not involved in immune response. And then why? So that you have to answer. So that's the, basically, these are the summary of this, today's lecture. Any other questions? <laughs>